My name is Choi, Choi Wai Chong. I'm the managing director of Meteps and uh, in, in Singapore, we're a data-driven monetization platform and also mobile marketing company. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Anton. I'm the chief entertainment officer. <laughs> Chief entertainment, yeah. entertainment officer uh, of uh, Touch10. We are a game studio slash publisher slash loyalty reward platform uh, from Indonesia. And uh, to date, we have launched about 27 mobile games with about 15 million uh, downloads worldwide and about 5 million from Indonesia. Uh, yeah, be happy to ask. Uh, be happy to answer any questions you have about Indonesian market. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Antara Sena. I'm the COO of Kira Games. And uh, Kiro Game is the developer of a game called Unblock Me, which was published around 2009. So we definitely know a lot of things about being old. And um, to, to date, we have been around for around seven years, and we have a total of around 120 million downloads. Thank you. All right, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Don. I'm the CEO of Daylight Studios. This is a game developer. We also I'm also the CEO of Questrop, which is a game publisher. I just did a talk next door. Um, so for development side, uh, we're about five years old now. Um, we don't have millions and millions of downloads, uh, but we have, uh, we have sold 100,000 paid copies of uh, Holy Potatoes Weapon Shop um, on Steam. Um, and we're also porting into mobile soon. Uh, we've got two new titles coming up too. Um, yeah. Um, and we're based in Singapore. Um, we're also starting a new development arm as well in Bangkok, and that's where I'm based. Um, yeah, that's all. Perfect. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for putting a nice panel together. Uh, I know most of the guys because we're based out of Thailand. Um, my name is Thomas Andreasen. I'm co-founder and executive producer of PlayLab. Uh, PlayLab is a mobile game development company that started about almost four years ago now. Um, and two years ago, we acquired a studio in Philippines. Our headquarters is in Bangkok. Uh, about nine months ago, we uh, raised $5 million from um, Monk's Hill Ventures. And uh, now we're basically continuing to grow our team. We're 100 people plus and expanding more into Southeast Asia. Um, my own background and focus for this conversation, I think, is more on the development side. So I'm, as well as co-founder, I'm also an executive producer for one of our upcoming titles that's definitely going to revolu revolutionize the social casino space. Um, so I'll tell more about that uh, probably throughout this conversation. So. I am Yann Marshall, the chief bastard of Sanuk Games. Sanuk Games is one of the oldest uh, game development studios in Thailand. We are 12 years old. We started in 2004. Uh, we, we develop casual games on console, PC, and mobile. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. OK, so in the past, I have been on the speaking slot, but this year I chose something different. I was telling Carl that I would like to moderate this group of panelists because I think we're going to have a very, very good like interactive discussion, okay? So let me start with the first question. Um, the reason why, how I put all these amazing people up here is because they have one thing in common, other than being located in Southeast Asia. All of them have their flagship product, okay? That's, that's already um, achieved a certain level of success. So I would like them to start with maybe some introduction about their flagship product and where it's currently at right now. Okay, maybe you start from that side, Yen? Okay, our flash, flagship game at this point is Bombing Bastards. That's where I get my title from. Um, yeah, it's a um, bombing arena game, like Bomberman. Uh, we did it originally on consoles, um, on PS4, on Wii U. We ported it on Steam and we ported it on mobile. Uh, so far, it's really a game that is engineered for the console market. So um, as a result, we made most of our money on consoles. Mobile was just like the cherry on top of the cake. Okay. Yeah, so uh, our, our probably our biggest uh, flagship game so far has been Juice Cubes. Um, we launched it three years ago, peaked about two and a half years ago. Uh, was top 100 grossing for five consecutive months across all app stores, uh, iOS, Android, and I think Facebook as well. Uh, Amazon, we did very well as well. 
Um, it's basically, uh, it was riding a little bit of the wave that, uh, to refer to King, King.com, who did Candy Crush, which most of us knows. Uh, so, so the game mechanic was a little bit, uh, it was a match three genre, similar to, to that, but more with a longer connection type of thing and better monetization. Um, not better, but yeah, <laughs> good. Uh, we got about, you know, over the couple of, last couple of years, we required, I think close to 30 million downloads uh, on that title, um, and yeah, it's uh, it's been an, an interesting ride because the we've we've seen the 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 space change a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, when we launched the game originally, it was basically a couple of months after Facebook launched their uh, advertising platform, so we were buying users uh, at. I think down to one cent, uh, which is unheard of in today's market. Uh, you can basically multiply that by 100, and you've roughly got the, 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 the right thing. So, so what we're also talking about today is, is, is the transition from what worked a couple of years ago to how do we continue to make games that will work for today, because if we work and build games that worked two, three years ago, um, they will probably not succeed in today's market. And uh, that's, an, that's, that's what we're seeing as well, is that it's hard to maintain that, that traction from games from before. Maybe On has some other insights on that. Um, but, but maintaining that steady flow of downloads, uh, which we have been acquiring through user acquisition and marketing, and, and we did publish with Rovio as well, um, so that has helped us initially, but, but more on the long tail of it, it's hard to keep that up because, as everybody knows, and I think it's a tale that's been told too many times, user acquisition prices are increasing, what to do about it, increase the monetization of the game, um, and we've been doing a lot of these things, and, and it's, uh, I think the key thing to that, and from our experiences, is doing live operations, doing things that continually engage the users, um, on, on the long term, uh, having tournaments for the weekend, these type of things is what we've, we've gotten into the game now, which we've seen crack that kind of curve, uh, the downward trend that we've seen uh, for the last couple of years in, in terms of uh, both downloads and, and revenue. So, so that's, that's basically been the changing factor for us is folk emphasizing more on live operations and after, after care for the users than getting the users into the game because that seems to I think everybody knows, and probably if someone disagrees, let me know, uh, that it's a blood red market, the user acquisition market at the moment. So you really have to have something on a product side that stands out in the market and not just uh, what you could do two, three years ago, launch something on the App Store and, and acquire hundreds of millions of downloads and, uh, and then live off of that for, for a very long time period. So it's what so. you do to get them to stay in the game, et cetera. To, to stay in the game, push notifications, in-app messages, make things relevant. Uh, users that have spent $10, you give them offers of $15. Users that have spent $100, you give them $100 offers, uh, et cetera, to always continue to monetize them e even further. But it's kind of dynamic depending on what the user does within the game. So. And is it still growing in the same curve? Or is it like slowing down and then you're moving on to a new game development kind of thing? Because you mentioned that you want to introduce, like you are introducing new games. Yeah, yeah. So what we've seen, and also as the reason why we're moving into social casino, is over the last couple of years, the last two years, uh, the top 100 has slowly been kind of eaten away by a lot of the social casinos, the slots, uh, poker games, etc. And 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 that's mainly because the value of that type of users is significantly higher than. Um, a casual gamer, for example, whereas in casual games you get volumes, you get tens and hundreds millions of downloads, but your monetization per user is very, very, very low. Uh, whereas in casino, your conversion rates uh, are higher and your monetization is higher. So in the new market where advertising costs are much more expensive, you, that, that mechanic works much better when you can actually monetize those users for A, significantly longer, and B, for more money during the time they're actually playing your game. Um, so that, and, and that comes into the, the, the whole live operations part of, right. uh, of Thanks. it. And Don? Okay, uh, so I, I actually completely agree with Thomas uh, on the um, free-to-play game model. I mean, live ops is everything uh, besides uh, UA and all that. I mean, so, I'm, because we also a publisher, so completely understand that. And I mean, if you have free-to-play game, you should definitely take care of your live ops and, you know, just to 
um, increase the lifetime value, and of course, um, you know, because UA is generally difficult. Um, I think the reason why Choi put me on this panel is because I'm the only company here that makes games for PC. Um, but truth be told, we, we, we never always were a PC game developer. Um, we started off making games on feature phone, um, the WAP games in Indonesia, and, and you know, uh, I had a lot of users in Nepal, I remember. Um, and then we moved over to smartphone games, and we found that it was difficult to make um, mid-core uh, smartphone games work, especially because the quality of mid-core games um, coming from uh, Japan and Korea and China were really, really good. Um, so we made a move and we took a bet and we decided to go into PC games. Um, um, and the first game we made was the most ridiculous game we've ever made. Uh, it's called Holy Potatoes, a Weapon Shop. Um, and we thought it was crazy, but um, the, the team just really went crazy with it. Um, and we, we made a game that really went viral. Um, so the Holy Potatoes uh, game was launched on Steam on the 13th of July. Um, and um, it was steadily picked up by guys like Total Biscuit, uh, Markiplier. Markiplier is like the number eight biggest you game YouTuber in the world, uh, 10 million subscribers. Um, and to date, we have uh, more than 800 user-created videos without paying for it. Um, and we have 4.5 million views on YouTube. Um, people just playing the game and sharing it. Um, all the Let's Play videos, all the Twitch videos. Um, and it just that just exploded it. Um, we we broke even on that product that we built for one year in a month. Um, and then every dollar that we make after that was just cherry on top. Um, and it was mind blowing, really. Uh, <laughs> And it was the first PC game we ever made, right? So um, because of that, uh, Daylight Studios is uh, working on two new titles, um, hopefully to launch this year. Um, and are we going to talk about that right now? Sure. Uh, the, the first game we plan to launch this year is called Holy Potatoes, We Are in Space. Um, Sci-fi game. Um, we, it is the biggest game we have ever built. Um, and all the mechanics from the first title, um, if you guys, you guys can actually check it out outside. Um, the it's it's a weapon shop uh, game where you it's a e economy kind of game where you handle logistics and all that. Um, all that the whole system of that um, the weapon shop is now just a single room in um, the bigger game that we're building now. Um, and so we we expect that to do a lot better. And we got a second title called uh, sorry third title called Holy Potatoes Weapons of Mass Production. Uh, so that one is uh, also something that we're working on as well. Yeah, both on mobile. Oh, no, no, both on PC. Um, and then after that, we're porting it to mobile. Um, when, and yeah, I mean, that has its own challenges, but um, because it has done well for us and we have a fan base now. Um, and oh, by the way, one of the reasons why we decided to move to PC um, was because we made a slew of different mobile games. And every time we made a single mobile game, we found that, um, and we got a whole bunch of users, right? They get excited about the game, they start spending money in the game, and eventually they leave the game, right? The problem with retention. But it's not just that. When they leave a free-to-play game, and especially if it's a mid-core game, the reason for leaving could, is usually negative, like because the GM gave them some you know, bad event or because they weren't happy with something or because life. You know, the wife complained about them, you know, spending too much time in the game and things like that. So they leave the game, right? And the chance of them actually jumping back to your second title or your following title is extremely low. And that's why we spend so much money on user acquisition, right, um, and, and marketing. Um, and so we decided to take a bet on building a franchise or try to build a franchise. Um, and we banged a lot on the Holy Potatoes IP, which we filed for trademark. Um, and, and we believe that um, if we make a really, really good game and we put everything into it and it's a offline, single-player, indie game, that they would fall in love with it, and hopefully, for the following titles, they'll jump in. And so with just that in mind, we worked on the first game and it became successful. Um, and we sold 100,000 copies, right? Um, and then now, we are thinking of how, uh, and now that we have the fan base, now we have the YouTuber base, right? We have hundreds of YouTubers all over the world, with videos in German and in, in Portuguese and Japanese and Korean and all these, and these guys have hundreds of thousands of millions of followers. So we just establish a marketing strategy for our PC games. Um, and that's how we're thinking of building this uh, in the development um, you know, pipeline. Yeah. Thank you. And on? Right. Yes. Um, so, um, so our flagship product was Unblock Me, which was released in 2009. And at that time, we released the two versions of Unblock Me, which are um, Unblock Me Paid and Unblock Me Free. And you have to understand that at 2009, that was like the um, preferred 
business model of doing mobile. You have a free version that you hope to convert users to your paid version. So and at that time, uh, the business model for us worked re really well. We had a lot of users downloading our free version, which eventually got to the number one um, game and was eventually the number one most downloaded game of the year. And um, at that time, we got uh, it was really successful in terms of converting users from the free version to go to the paid version. But um, from as time moved on, and um, 2009, 2010, 2011, we found out that a lot of our users are converting less to the paid version, and people are relying on expecting to play only free to play version. So we had to adapt ourselves, and we had to adapt our um, free version to have the same um, equal features at our pay version and try to monetize our users on um, the free version. We, so as time moved on, um, the ecosystem of the mobile uh, economy kind of um, slowly advanced. We, we slowly uh, start adding um, in-app purchase, we add uh, more of ads. At the time when we began with Unblock Me Free in 2009, we didn't even add a single, a single ad in our game, but as time progressed, we started be more aggressive on ads with interstitials, video ads, re reward ads, and um, you know all the certain ty types of ads. So as of 2016 right now, Unblock Me is, um, as I said, have around 120 million something downloads, and we are actually a hybrid ad uh, monetizing app, which uh, we monetize by in-app purchase, we monetize by ads, but most of our revenue will be from ads since since our design of the games are um, based on really simple mechanics and um, with this kind of simple mechanic, it, it would be re really difficult to change the game and tr uh, go for in-app purchase like um, maybe Juice Cube, which is designed specifically for in-app purchase. So um, as of right now, some of the things that I guess I see in Unblock Me is that users' behavior change. And you know, by user behavior change, I mean that during 2009, 2006 to 2016, I see a lot of our users demanding more complex gameplay. In 2009, um, Unblock Me, was a simple game, and it was enough for most of our users. But as time progressed, you know, it seems that they start learning how to play games. A lot of uh, the audience, casual audience, start learning how to, to play games at 2009. And as time progressed, they want something more progress. They, they learn how to play the simple games. Now they want more uh, complex games. They want to see something more advanced in our games, and um, we've been keeping up with that. We've been trying adding new um, multiplayer games to our games, and we've been trying adding more content to Unblock Me. So, I guess as time progresses, you know. So, do you, do you see those feedback in, on the app stores, or is it like from the statistics that you see? In uh, the we see it on the. We we actually try to set up a community, and okay. we have a fan page. We we talk directly a lot to our fans. So yes, we see it on our mm -hmm. um, Google review or we see it on our um, fan page as well. So you know, I guess as time progressed, you know, business model changed and um, the user engagement in terms of wanting more something complex changed as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and then Kwon? So yeah, I, I kind of miss the old days where the free and the paid thing just works because it's just not so complicated yes. as now. Yes. You don't need any analytics, you just need them to be in the top three. Usually the top eight will follow as well. Uh, but yeah, so we started the same thing 2009. I think our flagship, I would say flagship genre yeah. is cooking time management game. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of games. We have like 32 games now in the app stores and, and Google Play. But uh, yeah, you know, in life you have to have some affair and fling, right, somewhere. But <laughs> so we, we uh, finally I, I found my, uh, the so-called genre Love that, life. yeah. <laughs> genre that I like. You can see from my body, I like food, so uh, <laughs> I just make food as a game, and if you combine those two, beautiful things happen usually. So my, our first game was the free uh, game called Sushi Chain, 
uh, I was living in Japan. I just made this game called Sushi Chain because of the keyword and stuff like that. And then I, we released the paid version and the free version, and it was 2009. In 2010, it hit off, and we managed to get 1.2 million downloads. Of course, both free and paid, so a combined download 1.2 million downloads without any marketing. In 2013, we created a game called Ramen. So you know, after sushi, you gotta have ramen, right? So uh, ramen chain. Re until now, I think within two years, we achieved five million downloads. Again, with very limit, very very small amount. I think I only spent in the initial state. I only spent three thousand dollars just to try out Facebook ads, and I just say you no, know, uh, eff it. You know, I don't like this, and then just goes with the viral thing. So we achieved five million dollars within two years. Uh, and then we had some fling with other games, which I don't think we, we know how to handle the traffic and stuff. So recently, I think s seven days ago, actually one week ago, we, we, we came back to our first love, which is time management game now uh, called Warung Chain. Warung is a food stall in Indonesian. So we cater basically in, in the Indonesian market. And with zero marketing, we just contacted a YouTuber. He's the PewDiePie of Indonesia. His name is Arab. Uh, we, we contacted him and asked him to do a review for free, uh, and then he, uh, you know we didn't. So seven days ago, now we have about hundred thousand downloads uh, from both app stores, and I think if you see the title out with the old, in with the new, is what we learned from the from our experiences that nowadays people requires live ops even with simple games like like uh, like like Warung Chain and and all those chain games that we make. Uh, is that every week we add new content? Every week we have a weekly competition of of of, of among your friends, so that you can they, they have to invite your friends and and compete with each other to get the prize and stuff like that. And also again, push notification and how you analyze your users is something that uh, in the old days we don't have to do that. I don't even have a guy to do it now. I have a team of like five people just reporting to me what kind of data coming in and where the users quit and stuff like that, and to measure the metrics like LTV and stuff. So that's uh, the stuff that I don't like about the new one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Yeah. And I'd like to go back to Yen for a while. You mentioned about your bombing pasta game. So maybe you can yeah. elaborate a little bit about. So I think the growth has been from the last couple of months to a year, like extreme growth as well. Mm -hmm. Right. In I read in your post, etc. in countries like Afghanistan, etc. Maybe, uh, maybe you can oh, give us some uh, on that. The, the, the thing is, uh, for bombing best sets on mobile, uh, we released it on iOS and Android. Uh, nothing happened on iOS, really. I mean, Apple didn't want to pick it up, and uh, I think it has almost zero download. But on Android, I was fortunate enough to get Google to um, make a worldwide featuring. Uh, and uh, so the game was uh, featured worldwide, I think, for during one or two weeks. And um, what happened to my surprise is that by far our first market was Iraq, not Afghanistan, actually. Um, I mean, well, I shouldn't say our first market. Our first geo for downloads was Iraq, but the market is zero because there is no advertiser spending any money there. Um, Chances for the advertisers out there <laughs> if they want to give right yeah. traffic. Uh, then I guess uh, in terms of download, after that there was Brazil and Russia, and in the fourth position only there was United States. Um, actually, United States was pretty small. It was um, almost as small as any single European country like uh, UK or France or Germany. Um, yeah. So uh, it's something that you, you don't really plan uh, where your game is going to be successful. Much earlier on, in fact, we had the Spot the Difference game, which was premium at the time on iOS, and it failed everywhere except one country in which it was on the top of the App Store during maybe two weeks. It was Italy, for, for a reason that I still haven't figured out yet. Let us know when you know the reason. <laughs> OK, yeah. thank you very much. OK. now. The second question I'd like to ask is actually, what kind of key challenges you faced in your flagship product, and how did you overcome those challenges? Oh, wow. Um, well, the thing is, uh, well, the key challenge I face is that with all platforms together, I still haven't uh, had a break even. So that's a challenge <laughs> for the very continuation of the business. Uh, overcoming the challenge uh, is probably that um, I think you, you really have to find the right product. Uh, 
probably our team has been built on the capability of delivering high quality casual games on all possible platforms, PC, console, mobile, etc. But this appears to be a dead end at this point because uh, people don't pay for casual games anymore. There's so many stuff going, for, going out for free. So I guess um, what I'm trying to do now is to reposition the, reposition the team uh, on game genres that people still pay for. And I think there are such genres. Uh, it's funny, in fact, when I read the title of the panel, Out with the Old, In with the New, um, my publisher had recent successes, like they made millions of euros, uh, out of shipping games on consoles uh, in retail stores just this year and uh, when that worked for us for them sorry after they tried many different things uh, they completely killed their mobile game division and uh, whatever uh, so it means that uh, being willing to always get on top of the new trend uh, might not always be the best strategy because some of the older things still occur and when, while everybody is chasing the new rabbit, there are still rabbits there that uh, might be worth chasing. Typically right now everybody's talking about VR, uh, investors go into VR, etc. Uh, but where's the audience for it? Whereas there are still audiences uh, on other parts of the other segments of the market uh, that are more available to you because everybody's focusing on something else. So I would say uh, don't always ignore the old. On similar topics? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, what did you do in the past to overcome those challenges that you had? Because we're going to talk about... Yeah. So yeah. The, the challenges, if we're talking about juice cubes here, was uh, I think back then we when we launched it, it's about three years ago now, um, I believe. And, um, and I, I think we were, at that point, very early in the stages in terms of analytics, in terms of even user acquisition, even though we might have been at the forefront uh, of what we are. But compared to now, we were very, very early uh, in the stages there. And I, and I think our, the biggest thing was just a perception thing, and that was the challenge, was that we, 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 we believe that we would just push it out there and then let it run. And, and I think that perception has been, or that wrongful perception has been the most costly to us so far. Uh, what we should have done is because we, we made one, we thought, okay, it's this easy to, to make a multi-million dollar successful title, get out to uh, 20 million users. It's a piece of cake. This is easy, right? Um, that was the kind of mindset. So we were like, let's build another one. Um, and then we built another one, and we didn't get the same sound of traction. So our production efforts, our efforts into everything else, went towards a product that that didn't uh, hit the same uh, traction. traction as uh, Juice Cubes did. And and I think, in retrospect, that focus would have been much better invested into maintaining that title. And then that's what I'm preaching now from Hard Lessons is is, is live operations and managing the users after they get in. Because you can you can get uh, millions of users in, but there there is in most cases there's a finite amount of users out there, um, and and you want to make sure that you really take good care of the users that are spending in your game to keep them in your game to keep them spending because there is ten thousand other games every week that comes out to the app stores that they can jump onto. Um, so I think I think it's the perception. That was the biggest challenge that, that we had. Uh, and it took us quite a while to realize that uh, and then start shifting focus back towards a title that we actually had put kind of on the shelves uh, very early on. Um, but that's in terms of the game, mar uh, game development. Did you have any challenges in terms of the game marketing and how to market the games, your games? Um, well, the same, same story. Same story. Uh, user acquisition prices going right. up. Um, we were very early on and fortunate and lucky timing, time to market and everything. And, and that gave us the initial surge of, of users. And then we kind of continued to, to, to do that. But we also saw user acquisition prices going upwards. And then at some point, that metric became non-profitable for us. And we kind of stepped back uh, on that. Um, so that was the challenge. So now it's all user user acquisition based on data. Depends on how much you want to spend. Yes. It. Okay. Now it's much more granular. Right. Now we have analytics in. Now we yep. know exactly these are the channels that are good users and re-engagement as well is, is is a big part. And I think for titles with uh, 
double-digit millions of downloads. I think bringing those users back is, is in most cases a, a, a better ROI than bringing new users new into users. the game. Um, untested new users. <laughs> un untested new <laughs> users with yeah, 20, 30 percent of that being fake users Wind. and bots and everywhere else. So, so the, the advertising space is also difficult to maneuver for smaller developers. And, uh, uh, that's the current state of it, okay. and yeah. yeah. Thank you. And Don. Okay, key challenges. Um, so I think with the development, I think, well, I mean, we, we, we made an offline single-player game, so generally developing a game that has an extremely long um, gameplay time. Um, if you speed run it, it's about 15 hours. If you play through it and complete everything, it's about 40 hours. Uh, so planning a game that has a 40-hour gameplay, it's extremely difficult, but Besides the development side, I think the key problem with um, making an offline single-player premium game um, is when you want to port to mobile. Um, and that is difficult because, like, I mean, we are also a publisher, and we know for a fact that you cannot market a premium game, um, not with the typical channels. You can't do UA. No marketing network, even Metaps, will take it up. Uh, it's impossible because the conversion rate... Uh, it would be impossible, and the CPIs would probably cost more than the game uh, itself. Uh, so, uh, not to mention like the premium game market um, in um, besides Minecraft, by the way, um, it's not doing well. So, um, our thoughts on um, moving the game to mobile has been closer to um, trying out making the game free and then monetize using ads, um, simply because the game itself has had quite a bit of um, attention um, on YouTube and has a good fan base. Um, a lot of users have requested for mobile versions of the game. So we think that that might work. Um, but then it's still a challenge for us. Um, so I, I don't have a clear strategy of how we can solve this problem yet. Um, we, we believe that the only way that the premium game can be successful in mobile would be to get it featured. Um, and then because of the, um, you know, the eyeballs, uh, we, tend, we believe that we can generate revenue that way, either to be ads or um, buying the game itself. Um, for the new title um, that we're working on, we are building in the record time um, and the fact that it's a big game, so I think the development side of this is also challenging. Um, one of the key things that we face is really about how to keep it fresh. I mean, it's the same IP, the Holy Potatoes IP. Uh, many of the characters are still the same. And introducing new characters and, of course, making sure that the gamers still like the game. We don't want to make a game that is completely similar to the first game. Um, we, we think that players want something fresh, um, and that is the challenge in itself. And so, you know, development's always extremely high risk, um, and, and financially and, you know, spiritually, everything. Um, and when you put all that effort into developing a new game, um, you simply have no idea whether it will work. So um, the fact that we have a fan base to work, out, work from, it's definitely helpful, but um, in itself is a huge challenge. Yeah, and we'll have to see what happens. Okay, um, for, for us, Kira Games, um, our roots are um, really indies. Um, Unblock Me actually started from our CEO, which um, coded the, the whole game within two weeks and released it to the App Store. So, you know, we found success after that, but we had no clue what to do at that time. We had no clue what, uh, how to monetize, how to make money. We had no clue um, how to track users or anything at all. So the most challenging part was um, trying to figure out what to do, trying to figure out how to be profitable and trying to figure out how to keep users in our game, how to attract more users and how to um, make them happy. So for our game, you know, what we had to do to overcome the, those challenges was that we tried a lot of different things and you know, in, in those days, we never heard of A-B testing. But what we did was, let's try this ad network. Let's try this ad format. Let's try this and that. You know, and we keep trying it in each update until we find a pretty good, um, good position where we could make money and we could make our users happy. And um, we found the amount of puzzles, the amount of updates, the amount of contents, such as the game theme or such as the um, the difficulty of puzzles that players are playing that would make them more engaged in our game. So, you know, for us, it wasn't uh, knowing what to do. It was a lot of not knowing what to do and trying different 
things out, um, testing stuff out, and try to be analytical about the data that we are analyzing in our app. Okay, thank you. Can I have a quick uh, follow-up question, actually? What, what, uh, what was the like, top three things that you see working then as of now from a lot of those experiments that you ran? Um, what, what do you mean by that in terms of... Um, in, in terms of monetization and or, and or retention. Yeah. Okay, so in, in terms of monetization, we, we try to push in-app a lot. And at the, at the beginning, we were hoping that in-app would be a, a money generator for us because at that time, you know, everyone was making mo like 2011 or 2012 was like the uprising of in-app purchase and we tried that. But um, as we found out, uh, Users are happy to buy in-app purchase, but you know, um, it's not a very significant mar uh, user amount of users for us because we are at that time we had no clue what we were doing, so we were selling in-app purchase like 99 hints for one dollar, and we had like 10,000 puzzles. So you know, users don't really need that much hints to complete all of them. So um, at that time, our pricing strategy was pretty bad, so um, we kind of had to, after those errors, we kind of had to default back to playing with ads and see what we could do with ads. And um, I guess with ads, it's just the general, um, general stuff that you see these days that is that you are actually driving users to other applications, and you're sometimes of it, you will be losing you, your users and such like that. But um, and a lot of them do not like ads, you know. In, uh, most importantly, the ones that make you the most like interstitials or video ads, a lot of our users don't like, don't actually like that. So we have to be very analytical about how we di display our ads to not uh, frustrate our main core users. Based on our experience, we see like different kinds of genre of apps. Some apps. The more casual ones, like high DAU and lower ARPU, will generally like respond better towards ads. Whereas, like very high ARPU and lower DAU, will be, obviously respond better towards in-app purchases. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what we found out too. And Anton, you have anything to share before we move to the next question? Yeah. So, uh, because our our so-called time management uh, cooking game is more high, uh, you know. Uh, it, it the, the content get consumed so fast because it's mostly level based. Of course, you have, you can do some upgrades and stuff. Uh, so the 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 key challenges for us is how to make it relevant, how to retain the users yeah. once we get it, and also of course obviously because we also focus on Southeast Asia and how to monetize that region, that goddamn region of uh, you know people who don't pay <laughs> so much in the in in the Southeast Asia. So. These two things, uh, we, we we tried a lot of things, and we we kind of revolve. I mean, do some innovative thing that we think can change it. So we built this O2O platform. Basically, this O2O loyalty platform allows you allows users, especially in the region or Indonesia, to play the game, get some coins, and get rewarded by a physical things. And the advertisers are the one who pay for the physical things. So at first, Cyber Agent Ventures was the one who got interested and invested in us. Uh, and after that, uh, last year, 2015, uh, GRI uh, from Japan, I, I, most of you maybe know, but uh, it's not the GRI from China who make air conditioning. Yeah? It's the GRI from Japan who make <laughs> games. Because uh, people get confused and say like, wow, you got invested by air conditioning company. <laughs> Must be really <laughs> hot in, yeah, in the nature, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, the GRI from Japan. Uh, not the GRI ventures, but the GRI themselves uh, invested in us and acquire minority stake in that, uh, in, in our business. So I think in the future, uh, <clears throat> that is something that Touch 10 is trying to do, which is trying to go away from, not, not go away, but still maintaining the relevancy of us being a game developer and game publisher, but at the same time we do the services that can help developer to monetize and retain the users, especially for casual games Thank in the region. You. And how do you see this, my next question brings me to my next question, how do you see this mobile marketing trend moving forward in the next two to three years, for example? I mean, you've seen like from the console, PC moving to mobile, and then what's the next big thing that you're looking at right now? Some of you, I'm sure, are already developing some new games on some new <coughs> platforms. Yeah, whoever wants to answer that. Yeah, sure. Um, so my, 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 this is my own uh, 
created prediction okay. of what's going to happen. I think right now we've probably peaked at CPIs uh, in the market, or at least very close to, because uh, they've been rising for a couple of years. Now advertisers and media buyers they are getting concerned about um, the quality of users, fraud users and stuff that you're buying through advertisers. And the advertising industry is also, uh, in the last couple of years, have basically made leaps towards being more performance oriented. Um, meaning that as an advertiser, when you're buying advertising, you actually, it's, it's easier to get metrics on where are we buying this, these users from, what apps are they being shown in, and, and those are the advertisers that you want to work with because you know they've got their shit under control, yeah. basically. <laughs> <laughs> where there's other advertisers who just, yeah, we buy it from somewhere. So those you don't want to work with. Um, and, and, and I think that trend is, uh, has happened, so they can actually document the value that they're pro pro providing to the game developers when you're, when you're advertising. And then I think the other aspect of that is uh, when you look at traditional media, um, billboards, um, trains basically being covered up in, in, in advertisements, TV advertisements, radio commercials, a lot of those things have, they've, they've kind of both hidden a, a mark now where they've balanced out to some extent and in, in terms of cost of acquiring it. I've, I've talked to developers who also uh, actually can buy users at half the price through TV advertisements compared to um, online, traditional tradi online. like a performance marketing online, digital marketing. And, and, and I think that's, that's a good trend because that means that advertising money will flow differently, uh, which in my mind at least says that we've, we've kind of come to a peak where that's possible. So now, uh, which it's basically, it's always been about in games, is making a quality product and making sure that you're a ton better than your competitors out there. So looking at your competitors and making sure that your product is better in terms of the experience for the user, in terms of monetization, in terms of retention, in terms of analytics, in terms of live ops, in terms of uh, crashes, uh, less crashes, hopefully, um, and, and 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 that you, that's the benchmark you kind of have to hit in order to be successful. But it's 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 much more top driven, like it's always been. It's 200 publishers or 500 publishers in the industry that are very successful, um, and and you have to be in the 0.1 percent of publishers and developers in the in the whole industry in order to make a, a successful business going forward. Um, Unless you like, there's there's ways around for for smaller and mid 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 core publishers or uh, developers that can publish through uh, like niches that other bigger developers aren't focusing on. Um, but for the big big top dollar, I think it's it's limited to a few. So I think we've seen CPIs hit a roughly mark of where they are now, at least in the Western markets. They're not less like tier one markets. They're not growing as much. Uh, I think in Asia we'll probably still see for maybe a year uh, or something, but then I think similar things will happen because, again, TV advertisements in Asia is cheaper than it is in the U.S. Prime right. time. So um, that's that's my thoughts. And then it all boils down to can you can you can you extract that revenue from the users that you bring into the game, and can you do that more efficiently than all your competitors? And if you can do that, you have a business model. If you can't do that, you don't have a business model. All right. I would, uh, in fact, advise smaller developers to forget about free-to-play because it's extremely competitive and um, you need to have a high user base in order to make any business and also a high monetization. So uh, you have to be, basically, free-to-play free has to be mass market, in my opinion, uh, whereas niches are a space that can accommodate premium because there are people who are passionate about such or such specific subject and they are willing to pay for it up front. So uh, I think there is more, uh, I mean, the, um, how to say, uh, the, the cost of entry to the market uh, is lower in uh, premium niches than in free-to-play. Okay. Yeah. Just like going the other way, the opposite way of where everyone else is going. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, um, because we also publish this, I'll talk about what he mentioned about the mobile marketing part. Um, so, for mobile marketing, it is true, CPI prices are going up, and if you ever have done Facebook marketing, you would know that, damn, those prices keep going up, you know. Um, and the amount of money you can make um, is also increasing, yes, but the price of CPI is just ridiculous. So, um, a lot of publishers are going to alternative sources of marketing, um, and because TV and outdoor and all the older forms of marketing have been around for the past 20, 30 years. Um, they're pretty much stabilized in terms of pricing. 
Um, so that's one way of doing marketing. Um, of course, tracking that is, is much harder. And that's why a lot of publishers and developers choose to use digital marketing because there's a lot more tracking. You can track performance, and then if I'm making more money than I'm spending, therefore I'm profitable. Um, but for TV and all that, it's a little bit harder to track. Um, so we actually, I mean, for Quest Drop, we've actually gone into influencer marketing. Uh, one of the reasons is because we see huge success of uh, Holy Potatoes um, in the West because of influencers, and we didn't pay them to do it. Uh, we figured we'd build a business around it. So to, uh, to date, we have about 90 million followers um, in Southeast Asia through our influencer network, and we provide marketing for publishers from East Asia um, uh, into Southeast Asia. Um, we find that uh, the cost of marketing is much lower, um, and we have uh, established um, um, various forms of tracking, and of course, uh, you know, um, you know, the right optimization for the right influencers to, pr to, pr to promote the right product um, and all that. So that's our way of uh, overcoming that problem. Um, okay, so I guess we, Curricap, since our game Unblock Me is based on ads, we don't do a lot of um, marketing doing UA, but we do some. And, you know, the numbers we see from two years ago to this year is extremely jumping up and I think moving forward there's no indie that would be possible to to purchase the CPI at this rate so I think from our perspective um, moving forward for indie companies you, you got to uh, create some kind of um, advantage you you know for us we have a lot of users we have our own platform that we are trying to create um, and tr try to push users to our new game and um, we are trying to push more on social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, or um, YouTube, and be more social with uh, social influencer in Southeast Asia. So I think moving forward, you know, um, there's no, there's not going to be the no more marketing that you see in today. You know, moving forward, you're going to have to change it up. You have to switch and try something more creative than what they are doing today, because the price CPI currently, you know, in these can can afford that. Yeah. I mean, really quickly because we are running out of time, but I think uh, I like the number zero. Zero marketing is something that I always aim. And uh, if you see a lot of touch 10 uh, things, is, is more is, is more my connection of, of befriending people with a lot of traffic. For example, uh, if you guys know, we, we, we made two games with 9GEC. 9GEC is about 90 million uh, visitor per month and our game was doing really well with, with them. And then in Indonesia, we also partner with an Instagram user who have 9.4 million followers. And recently, we, we did this Warung Chain game, and we approached the PewDiePie of Indonesia and uh, get 100,000 just like that. So I think moving on, moving on, we will do something like that. My advice is to find your partner uh, who, who can have that kind of traffic and. Uh, you know, just try to market it. Of course, you have to be also in the same level uh, of gameplay or, or game uh, to, to do that, yeah. Um, I have two questions. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is, since you guys have been around for a while, um, you folks probably developed your apps natively, and then over time, have you tried to transition to something that's platform independent so that you can support it easier? That's number one. And secondly, Again, since you've been around for a while, that's a lot of opportunities for others to try to clone you. So have you taken any steps to address that? Or what have been your experiences? So sorry, the first question is before what we use and now what we use, is it? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer quickly. I mean, for us, at first it was the, the iOS era where you can only code with Objective, no, sorry, right? Objective C, right? Yeah, I'm not a programmer, so I don't know. My, my cousin is. <laughs> so, and, but now we use Unity 3D only. Uh, that's for Touch 10. For a second, I think cloning, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I really hate pi piracy, but I think sometimes it's an achievement to be pirated and cloned because that means your game is good. So to address that, I, I just create more games because I, I believe that, the mo especially in the mobile market, people are always hungry for good content. So if your game is good enough, I, it's, there's, there's always room for others to clone you, and it's okay, it's fine, I think. So, yeah. Um, can I answer that question quickly? So um, one thing of the things we tried was HTML5, which is platform independent, and um, it works really well in 
certain countries like Japan that are monetizing very well on that platform. And the second question is cloning. Um, we just the other day, you know, we had this kind of review that gave us one star and said, your game clone um, wrote a ball, which, which is a really famous and good game. But actually what wrote about it was they clone our art. So, you know, so things happen, but um, the best way to protect it was, was that we actually trademark our terms of unlock me. So nobody could take that um, and use it against us. Uh, so, first question, Unity. All right, second question. Uh, <laughs> for, for cloning, uh, so we, we, we don't really care. Um, I mean, our game got pirated within three hours by Skid Row. I was like, whoa, Skid Row. And then we were like, okay. Um, what's cool, though, uh, was that we don't have a Chinese version of the game. Um, and two weeks after we launched the game, apparently a uh, Chinese company cloned Holy Potatoes. Uh, not cloned, basically cracked Holy Potatoes and completely translated the game, which is crazy, because the game has full of puns and jokes and crazy stuff, right? And so we even saw Let's Play videos in China playing the game, uh, which has pretty good jokes, you know? So what we did was we cracked the cracked version of the game and we took the Chinese out. Um, <laughs> and then we, 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 we did our QA and we found it was 70% okay. So we're just gonna fix 30% and release a Chinese version. Boom, we save money. <laughs> That's smart. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, first we did Flash initially four years ago. We talk, we sat in a meeting, I think it was uh, with, I'm not gonna mention the name, but a tier one developer, a triple A developer, and they said Flash is the new thing, you have to do it. Uh, we did it, failed. Uh, half of the game didn't even get on mobile due to performance issues, so scrap that. And then Unity Lover okay. uh, since then. Unity guys are here? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> I'm okay. not getting commissions for this. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I Cloning. think that's it. Huh? And what do you do for overcoming the cloning thing? Uh, cloning is it's quite easy. You can just write your own cease and desist, find the developer and say, hey, stop doing what you're doing. And 50% take it off straight away and the other 50% probably never read your email, but it's, it's a fast way to get rid of it. So that's what we did originally and uh, now we don't do it really that much more unless, it, unless they're getting significant traction right. of some sort. So. I would never tolerate that anybody clone our clone of Bomberman. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, actually, yeah, I mean, uh, you can't protect a game idea. If somebody wants to steal your idea, uh, well, what can you do? Uh, unless they steal actual, uh, like, art or material, uh, there's not much you, you can uh, do. But generally, the second movers, with very few exceptions, uh, don't really have a go at uh, making it big anyway. I guess, uh, thank you very okay. much. Thank you. So uh, following this, we have a coffee break outside. So if you have any questions you want to ask in private, feel free to catch any of these guys. Thank, thank you. you very much.